also at this time, a lot of the, this is the mid 90s, and a lot of the DC characters were going through different flux periods. Superman had his stupid mullet back then, uh. which is why he has a stupid <laughs> mullet in the flashbacks, because they made Alex paint a mullet on him in the flashbacks. And so, a lot of times, Alex and I deliberately went away from the existing looks of those characters in that exact moment in, in 1996 DC history so that nobody would come along and make us paint a mullet on it. So that we could just say, oh no, no, this is our version over here. Yes, sir? Uh, as a teacher and a pastor, uh, and as a fan, a couple things. The role of Superman, I thought, was as a pastor, is very interesting because uh, in some ways his rejection, the way that society rejects him, yeah. is in some cases I think you could equate with the way that the people of Jesus' time. I mean, if you wanted to go in the religion direction, yeah. you know, the, kind of how the, 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 the people that should have cared the most and right. understood the most about Christ yeah. rejected him, and then, you know, he still comes back the same way that in the Bible story, Christ comes back to save the day, yeah. and that sort of thing. I, I, that was one of the things that I noticed when I read it the second time through. And then the other thing, just as a fan, this helped uh, me fall. This book helped me fall in love with the JSA all over again. Oh, that's cool. Because uh, the the way that uh, you know, Power Girl shows up, and then uh, you have uh, Doctor Midnight with just the smoke thing, and yeah. some of that. Just some of those characters. Seeing some of those characters again made me rediscover that. And of course, your work on uh, the the uh, hardback uh, showcase series of the All Star stuff. Oh, thank you. That's cool. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you know. What was the exact reason of when Magog kills the Joker? Right. And the Joker was there with the whole low explaining thing. Yeah. And what was the decision of making it the Joker out of all of any person that could have been that could have targeted Lois Lane? There were two reasons. One is that we want it because it's not just a Superman story. We wanted to open it up to the, the DC universe as a whole a little bit. So that, that made, and we already had a role for Luther. Um, Joker seemed. Joker seemed a better pairing for Superman because up to that point, I think we've seen a couple of Superman-Joker stories since, but up to that point we really hadn't seen a Superman-Joker collision uh, and this idea that this insane creature that Superman would not be able to understand or fathom how his mind works at all. Um, that, I think that, that was the reason we, we picked the Joker. Also, Alex draws a great Joker. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so I, when I when I read through, particularly the scene, but the showdown between Magog and Superman, yeah. and, and, the, and the present of the story, I was struck by, I guess, me being a younger reader, associating myself more with Magog and looking at how, I think, even generally in Western civilization, we've sort of been trying to put away our myths and move away from a a like a magical world into more of a scientific world that just doesn't have room for wondrous things and wondrous stories. Yeah. And I guess I'm just kind of curious how much, uh, how much of that idea that, that you seem to be saying, and I, I couldn't tell if you were saying it or if I was just reading myself into it, yeah. that we are, uh, we are poorer for the loss of the, the magical and the wondrous. And, and, and look, you're, I felt like you were telling me, like, look what you become yeah. when you put that stuff on it. Could you talk that's, about that a bit? That's very much it, that you hit upon it. I mean, it really is. The, look, what you, look what we lose when you ground yourself that deeply. When you, when you become so petty and venal that you have turned a blind eye to the wonder around you, and it's not that not just a religious statement. It's, it's a statement. It's a statement that I how I not only how I see the world, but that's how superheroes exist. That's what they were defined to do. I've always said that superheroes aren't about rules; they're about flying. <laughs> and and so the moment you start sort of the more of the real world you impose on them, the more you, the more of the, to, you know, the world outside your window you impose upon these characters that were, they're basically fantasy constructs, you, you take away their power, you diminish their power, and, and they just become, you know, in a lot of cases, just sort of quaint, bygone era things. Like, you know, they, don't, they no longer speak to sort of universal truths. That kind of answer the yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you kind of said earlier that um, Captain Marvel really didn't have a role originally. So, who came up with the he has him shazaming everyone all over the place? I was. I, like, how did you get to that? It was. It was. That was. I know Alex wanted him to be in the finale because Alex was always a big fan of, of of Superman Captain Marvel fights when he was a kid. Um, so the I think the idea of Superman of Captain Marvel using the magic 
lightning as a weapon against Superman, I'm pretty sure with Alex's, but we still had to get there because, super, because again, in the original concepts of the stories, Captain Marvel was just another one of Batman's guys. It was basically Superman, Superman's team and Batman's team, and the two of them are button heads. And, and when I kept insisting that, no, Superman and Batman are friends, we need to be a little more layered than that, that's, what, that's when we started to have different houses, if you will, different sort of different fiefdoms of these characters. Um, and that's how Wonder Woman rose to power in the story. And that's how Captain Marvel actually became my favorite character because he, the other thing is that, I mean, he, he really is, he's really what the story's all about because it, he's the one who is, as Superman opines, you know, he's the one who has a foot in both worlds. He is the only superhero in the DC Universe who is both a superhuman and an ordinary person. And just by saying a word back and forth. So that makes him the key player in this gigantic Armageddon war between humanity and superhumans. Wow, it sounds so much smarter when I say it like that. Yes, sir? <laughs> uh, this is just a general writing question. When you, when you write a story like this that has all these different themes and these, these larger um, ideas like morality and religion, do you set out to write like a story about religion no. or a story about politics? No. Or do you just tell a good damn story and then that stuff. That's all you do. You sit down, you you write it. A story. A story is somebody wants something and something's in his way. That's a story. And if you and, and you everything builds from there. And you make it interesting, suspenseful. You put yourself into it. And then what you find out. Theme is not something that you start with. Theme is something that you look back on when you finish the work and you go, oh, I guess that was about father and son, or oh, I guess that's about you know being alone or whatever. That's it's. It, 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 you know, I think that the reason that we hit more, you know, several themes pretty hard in this is because you first you bring two points of view to the table, mine and Alex's, and secondly, it's such a broad, vast cast of characters that some of them play into certain themes more than others. Um, we'll get everybody, I promise. You, sir. With the uh, character of uh, Norman McKay, yeah. based, it's based heavily on Alex's mm -hmm. father. Yeah. Uh, how much did Alex tell you about their denomination? He, it's funny, he actually, Alex really wanted me at first to sit down and talk with his dad and meet with his dad and so the, and I put my foot down and like, I look, I'm sure your dad is a lovely man and I will look forward to having a nice dinner with him when we are done. But if it's hard enough to write a character like that to begin with, it's going to be much harder if I feel like, he, like he, he's sitting on my shoulder, like your dad is like looking over my shoulder. You know, I, I don't want to have to worry about whether or not I don't want any notes like my dad would never say that. I don't want that would just that would make me insane. Uh, and it turns out he is a lovely man. He's a very, he, I think he's still to this day still sort of quaintly bemused by what it is we do. But um, not in this, not in any. I mean, he's a sharp guy, not in a senile way. I'm just saying he just he just this is not his his world. But I think he's I think he's very flattered. So, but yeah, I just I stayed away from the Ross household because I didn't want to I, I didn't want to have to take dictation. So um, who else? Yes, sir. It seems like uh, in some of your more recent work, you essentially combined Magog and Superman, specifically your evil. Yeah. And did any of that, that um, plan, did you, kind of, did you kind of go through the same kind of almost thematics of yeah. the, the death, the destruction, the yeah. everything that Superman and King Kong fought against? Yeah, I don't think it was. I don't think it was intentional, but it certainly, I, clearly, it speaks to themes that are important to me about, like I said, again, the role of of these of these simple characters that are basically child wish fulfillment, and how they have grown to become not only pop culture icons but sort of moral and ethical icons for a lot of us, um, and with irredeemable. In particular, which was, I, for those of you who don't know, I had a series I did that was basically what if Superman were a jerk? Um, or what if Superman had grown up without the, the moral and ethical foundations that it would have taken to, to build him into the man he is today? Um, you, you really get a chance to play with, okay, how do the things that you learn when you're five years old from Superman, how do those things translate into the real world when you are an adult? Because uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the whole of it, they do. The basic fundaments, be kind to people, do the right thing. These are all very easy, simple things to say, and that's exactly the moral code you should be living by if you're five years old. Um, as you get older, 
you want to cling to those tenants. I still believe in them, but it's a very complicated world uh, out there. And, and some people are capable of, of looking past that complicated morass of gray to still cling to, to the hold to those truths that are evident to them. And some of them, like the, char like the character in the Irredeemable, are not as capable. So I'm not sure I am. I'm not sure many of us are. Yes? I've actually got a comment and a question. Hit me. The comment is a few months ago, you probably have no idea about this, but you actually retweeted on Twitter a piece of my artwork. Yeah. And was trying to break into the, you know, the comic industry for a while. And because of that, a writer out of Ireland saw the artwork and followed you. Yeah. And I just got my first comment published. Congratulations. Okay. That's good on you. Nicely done. The question is um, the epilogue of this, the diner scene. Yeah. Did you always have that in mind? No. Or no. that was just it was a kind of an afterthought. Thing? It was totally the whole diner scene was totally an afterthought. It, we, we had already finished the book, and then when DC wanted to collect it as a trade paperback, they offered us the option of putting in uh, a few of the pages that Alex had worked on that we weren't that, that just didn't have a place in the finished product and then we also they also wanted us to not wanted us I mean they just offered us the chance to do some sort of epilogue and I, and it was a really cool triple play it was it was that tinkers to ever tinker to ever to chance triple play where um, Alex said you know it should be about Wonder Woman and Superman announcing to Batman that he's that they're gonna have a kid and without letting the ball hit the ground, I said, and Batman's the godfather. And then without letting the ball hit the ground, their editor said, and the whole story takes, that whole place takes place in, uh, in the Planet Krypton. Does everybody else in that scene know their public identities, or is it just the people like the, the world leaders they reveal themselves to? Does everybody else just like not have a clue? I don't, don't think anybody, you know, do. in 18 years, not one single person has ever thought to ask me why nobody came up and said, excuse me, aren't you Bruce Wayne or aren't you Clark Kent? So I failed. No, no, that's, no, that's good. No, good. That's a good question. It, you know, I've never even occurred to me. And everybody seems oblivious to who they are in the diner. You're right. You know, hi, I'm Robin. Sure you are. <laughs> I told you that's a... That's a very. I guess they just assume they're just amazing cosplayers. That's a. That's a good. Point. <laughs> <laughs> Clark would be long since dead. That's true. At this point, he disappeared after Lois. Yeah, but remember, he. But, but he actually says at the like it, it, in at the climax of the story, they actually just say, "Look, we're not. Gonna, we're going to live among you now." I, I think. I don't think he actually does. He. I don't think he specifically says, no. you know, "Hey, my name is Clark. Can I work for the planet?" But the implication is there that he's going to be living. Up. Even if he's not, people would be. People would be going, hey, isn't that Superman in a in overalls? Um, he's wearing glasses at the end. Well, he's wearing the glasses, so nobody recognizes him. There you go. <laughs> good, good save. Oh, that never worked. Uh, who else had a question? Yes, sir. Uh, for the destruction of Wayne Manor, he used Two Face and Bane. But there wasn't really anything other than just saying, after his identity was revealed, Two Face and Bane crashed the mansion. Yeah. Was that? Forced thing from the DC editorial since there wasn't any real. Like, I, I think they, they already knew who he was. So it's like, did he just wake up on Thursday? Like, you know, poor. How about I just crash your house? I think they. I, I knew we wanted the destruction of Wayne Manor. I know that we it, we wanted it just to be a line of dialogue. We didn't have the room for it. And I want to remember that Bane was sort of thrust upon us by the back group. Uh. So but we didn't have to show him, which is good. So Alex, Alex, Alex hates anything that was invented after 1980. So, <laughs> it's just, so if, it, if you're a character and you were created after like 1979, he's got no use for you. And I, you know, I, I don't feel quite that strongly, but I get where he's coming from. Yeah. Uh, I had two quick questions. Sure. Um, one, do you think uh, Captain Marvel would have eventually killed Superman? Yeah. And did you think about um, possibly killing Superman and yeah. making him a yeah. martyr? No, no, because for, to, all right. First off, I think it would have, I think the lightning bolt would have killed Superman eventually. Yeah, because it's it's magic. It's just one of those things he can't deal with. Uh, but beyond, I it never would have occurred to me to, to kill Superman as a martyr in this. I think it's something we talked about. But what's what's interesting to me about the whole thing is that it was never meant to be a Superman story. It was meant to be a big giant, you know, Stephen King level multi-character capture of the DC Universe, but the problem is, and Paul Levitz, the publisher of DC, is the one who articulated this to me years later. He said, the problem is, Superman's such a strong character that when you put Superman into a story, it becomes a Superman story whether you want it to be or not. And he's absolutely right. So once it became clear that that was happening, dude, I'm not gonna kill Superman. 
I, that's just that would it would be a, be a, that one he doesn't get to learn anything. That one he doesn't get to learn anything. If Superman dies, he he may be able to learn in his dying in his dying breath what he needed to learn here in the story. But then he doesn't get a chance to put it into motion, and that was important to me. That's a good question. Um, there were others. Who else? Let's see. Uh, who actually? Who was not asked a question? Because we'll, we'll make sure we get everybody. But yes, sir. Uh, you had written Impulse around the same time. That was about a young hero sort of learning to be responsible, and that idea sort of ties into Kingdom Come, where you have all these heroes who don't have inspiration. Do you think that there can be younger superheroes who <clears throat> do the right thing and do it well without necessarily having a mentor? I would have been one. I would have been the idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, there, there are kids who were 12 going on 12, and there's kids who are 12 going on 20, and we all know them, and, and there are. I know it wasn't, I've never, I've never wanted to suggest that all young heroes need a mentor father figure, but I also think that a father-son relationship is one of the strongest metaphors and, and strongest themes in all of Western literature, so it's going to creep its way in. Um, and there's also, beyond that, specifically to DC Comics, DC Comics is very much, or at least it used to be, very much a generational <clears throat> saga. Um, this idea of golden age heroes and silver age heroes and modern age heroes and passing the torch down and stuff. So I think that the idea of mentors and the idea of, of inspirational characters to other superheroes is something that feeds, I think, quite nicely into what the DC Universe had become when it existed. Uh, don't get me started. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, this is something I read, and I might have just misremembered it, but after, I read that after you did Kingdom Come, DC started aligning some of their uh, plot points on character designs or costumes to match what you had done in the future. I was just wondering if that was something you remembered or if they actually did or not. It wasn't, I don't think it was, I don't think it was a, first off, it wasn't an overnight thing. And secondly, I, I think what happened was, over the years, you know, newer creators were coming in who had read Kingdom Come when they were in college or whatever, now they're working in comics, they were sort of impressed by some of the character designs and so forth, um, and, and sort of drew some of that stuff. And it was, it's nice to see. I mean, that, that's a nice nod. I think the only thing, I, in terms of how, what we did with the characters, I, I think the only real lasting impact that we had that I think <clears throat> hangs on to this day is this idea that Wonder Woman is now considered, you know, equal among the among the three as opposed to before that story she was just it was Batman and Superman and then everybody else um, so um, uh, let's see uh, yes sir in the hat actually yes sir um, was there ever I'm, I'm not looking for the actual like plot points or anything like that but was there ever a, a sense when <coughs> this was going up through the approval process and during the art process and the hashing out process and even the release process that you guys were creating kind of that next generational Watchmen. You know, that this was, guys, we haven't had a Watchmen at DC in 10 years. You're our next Watchmen. There, there, I, I can almost give you the date, because it was, it, I'm writing the scripts in my own home, and I'm oblivious to the buzz, but people in DC, you know, they ever, when Alex's pages come in at DC Comics, they're all running around showing each other the pages, the beautiful pages. And then I was finishing the script to issue three and starting the script to issue four when the solicitations came out for the first one, when we first started ballyhooing Kingdom Come. I was utterly unaware of the buzz this book would generate. I was utterly unaware of the fact that this thing became such a huge phenomenon before the first issue even came out that I stared at a blank page for like two weeks because I was just frozen. So they almost, they almost screwed it all up by that much pressure. They really did. I mean, I, I, yeah. I will never forget how, how I went from issue, issues one through three. I mean, they weren't easy to write, but they were fun to write. There was nothing fun about issue four, right? <laughs> it was just, I felt like I had all of comics in the room with me, you know, judging, and, and, and I had to not screw it up. Uh, and I, man, I mean, we rewrote, we rewrote those last, even after they were painted, I was still rewriting those pages up until the very last second, trying to find exactly the right notes and trying to stick the landing exactly right. I don't ever want to go through that again. That sucked. Uh, yes, sir? 
Uh, well, since Kingdom Come is about the future, yeah. and uh, Thrillbent mm -hmm. is obviously a totally different direction Good segment, for all the things. Uh, I was curious, like, what do you see as the future of comedy you know, five, ten years down the road? What, what's going to go with comics? I think, I mean, I think there'll always be a place for print comics. I, I think that the people enjoy, and I do too, enjoy the, the fetish objects, if you will, of having like, the actual physical copy in hand. And, but man, I mean, if you're not reading comics on your iPad or on your computer or on your tablet or on your phone, you're missing a bet because there's stuff that's being done, not, not just at my own site, throwbet.com, throwbet.com, free, <laughs> free, free comics to look at, but a lot, a lot of other places as well that are using, that, that understand that it, we're not just selling you pictures of comic book pages. We are, we are using the things that digital can do uh, in, in terms of transitions, in terms of storytelling, in terms of new tools for yeah. storytelling that still are very profoundly comics. Absolutely, they're not motion comics, they right. don't have sound, they don't have voiceovers, they don't have crap. <laughs> they're still comics, but there's certain tools and, and, and things that you can use only in digital that I think are very exciting. And I think that the storytelling moves into digital in the next few years very strongly, and I think more importantly, the distribution. <coughs> Is yeah. there? I mean, again, uh, you know, how many comic stores in Mississippi? Three, maybe. You know, but uh, you know, we iPads—they sell every thirty seconds. So, the the uptick of digital sales uh, is gone from something like <coughs> like one percent two years ago to four percent of the business a year ago to twelve percent of the business this year, and it's continuing to rise. And the nice thing about that is it's not chipping away at the brick and mortar comic stores, which was the fear. Yeah. Uh, instead, it's feeding into it. Uh, and I think that's great. So I think that uh, not just on a, I'm excited on a storytelling level that comics is moving heavily into digital. I'm also excited just as somebody who likes his material being out there and available, that it's a, it's available, you know, three in the morning when you don't feel like, you know, when you, or when you don't, or when you don't have access to a comic yeah. store, so. Some of the stuff you did on Insufferable, just, I, Gas got loud when I would hit the next mouse over button, and you Thank know the, the way you would do the panels and yeah. stuff was just really creative and astounding. Thrillbent.com. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Yeah, that's there. You go. There's the website. So it's uh, is it is it loading? Are we, on, are we live on the internet? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's gone. Okay. It's when you have an actual internet connection as opposed to we have an aerial here or something. Okay. What do we got here? Every spoiler show the end of Insufferable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're doing, I mean, it's, yeah, it's sort of like tap, 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 and you're just being led to the story. Balloons pop up, things change, and it's, and it's made to fit that landscape tablet format or that landscape computer screen format. So you're not, you know, when you read something on, on when you read a traditional comic on the tablet or on your computer screen, you're frequently having to scroll up and down and up and down and left and right and zoom in here and get this panel here and and it's not the same experience as just seeing the page out in front of you. So, so this is what we're doing. Thrillbent uh, is up now. It's uh, free comics for the downloading, free comics for the reading, and we are relaunching uh, in the first week of April with a bunch of new content, more insufferable, uh, uh, Wormwood by your uh, damnation trial Wormwood by your instructor Christy. Um, uh, some other series and yeah, and now I'm I'm and right at are, I'm right at your time. So, um, so thank you all for attending. Um,